Hi, my name is David Hartman, and this is Best Practices for Charter School Authorizing. This is part of the Wisconsin Authorizer Support Project that's funded by WORKS. SchoolWORKS is an education consulting company, and we work with schools, networks, districts, state departments of education, and foundations. And our work is generally seen through these five key service offerings. We help clients assess the quality of their practices and build capacity for better results. So basically our work in Wisconsin is focused on accountability services, which focuses our work specifically with charter school authorizers. During this session, we will review the objectives for the session and the project. We'll look at the charter school relationship and school work cycle of effective authorizing. We'll have an opportunity to reflect on all of this. So the objectives of the WORKS project are to promote quality charter schools and authorizing excellence, promote national principles and standards for quality authorizing, review authorizer performance through continuous improvement. And for this specific session, we will consider the core components of authorizing and having clear processes We'll talk about how those expectations are communicated and assessed over the course of contract, those expectations that an authorizer has for a school, and reflect on authorizing and how authorization is an opportunity for an authorizer to meet community needs with high quality charter school authorizing. So we start everything with the relationship. The approved charter school contract is between the charter school board and the authorizer. It's right there in the middle. A charter school board is held accountable to the terms set forth in the contract. So an authorizer's main responsibility is to provide oversight on the school's performance and results within academics, finances, operations, and compliance. So basically, the charter school board provides deliverables, which are the results for the expectations that are identified within the contract. And in turn, for all of that, the authorizer grants the charter school board autonomy to operate in a way that is different from a district school. Charter school board's main responsibility is to provide the program and conditions to provide those results. So effective authorizers, you can say uh, that they set forth reasonable performance expectations. So they challenge the school to do better than they already are doing, but they don't send, set unattainable goals. They provide oversight and progress for monitoring those expectations, and then ultimately make decisions based on evidence and results. Less effective authorizers operate and micromanage authorized schools and make school level decisions. So at SchoolWorks, we look at authorizing through the cycle of effective authorizing. It has five pie pieces or component parts authorization, which is also the application process, contracting, oversight, corrective action or intervention, and renewal. So we believe great schools are held to great expectations. And we really think that you need to focus on those expectations in every conversation an authorizer has with a board. So specifically, we start with authorization. So this is the new school application review process. So effective authorizers create a transparent framework with clear expectations for, those, for that application and the review. So a strong application contains the steps, the questions, the criteria, all of those things about the academic program, the finances uh, that are expected traditionally in a new school application. They also include procedures Things like what's the deadline, who's involved in the process, what type of documentation do we need, how many pages, and those types of things. So it's up to an authorizer to define all those expectations and standardize them. The process also should align with the priorities of the authorizer. So if you're a district, uh, often districts have strategic plans uh, and uh, initiatives that they are expecting uh, for their district and the schools that they have. So a charter school authorization process or a new school application 
should align with those priorities and include uh, and reflect some of those same expectations. A clear process needs to have clear uh, decision-making criteria. So that typically manifests itself in a rubric. Uh, so rubrics have the criteria, sometimes sub-criteria that delineate exactly what the expectations and articulate with specificity what the evaluation will look for. Finally, um, there ought to be transparent procedures for the communication. So what that should be is how are you going to communicate within your organization, upward, over, and then out of your organization, what that is. So if you are an office that is working to do this review and then you need to brief your board or your superintendent, you need to have clear expectations for what it is that you will include, what's the information that those folks need in order to make that decision, and then ultimately when a decision is made, how is that information communicated out in a public sense? So it's good to take a moment and reflect on this and think, how can we in our office improve our authorizing process? Now, if you're a well-established authorizer, you may want to consider the second question, and how can we use authorization to address known community needs? So how more specifically can you satisfy the, expect or the deficiencies or community needs that are being expressed through the data? Within Buzz, you can download this worksheet that'll work in parallel with this um, activity. And so you can start with the upper left-hand corner and start to identify some answers to your questions here. So I'll go back to this and you might wanna take a second to pause this video and start to consider either or both of these questions. Performance contracting, the second piece of the pie. Effective authorizers establish charter contracts with clear measurable outcomes. So you get what you expect and the school or the board will only deliver on what they know your expectations are. So a charter contract is like any other contract. It legally joins the authorizer and the charter school board and defines that relationship and then it guides everything that leads to renewal. Contracts typically include performance expectations for academic, financial, operational, oftentimes mission expectations. Additionally, school and authorizers rights and responsibilities. What's an authorizer need to do as part of this relationship and what does the school or the board need to do? Contracts often need to be amended and so that process ought to be defined in the contract Oversight guidelines should be in there. How is the authorizer going to provide oversight? Intervention processes or corrective action. So none of this should be arbitrary. Everything should be de defined in the contract, either in the terms of the contract or as an attachment uh, or an exhibit of the contract. Your lawyers can determine exactly how that should manifest itself, but really you should define exactly what are, what are the bounds to any of your oversight or your interventions. Ultimately, this all leads to renewal or revocation. So with a high quality school that's meeting expectations, there's a renewal process in which the contract can be renewed and extended. And so what those criteria are and how that process unfolds ought to be identified in the contract. In the worst case scenario, a revocation, uh, which happens during a contract term, that needs to be defined uh, so that both parties know exactly what the process is if an intervention that leads to revocation ought to occur. And oftentimes contracts themselves have waivers. So if there is an agreed upon allowable um, waiver from state law or expectations within your district, those waivers ought to be identified within the contract. So go back to your worksheet and go to the second question, what is missing from our charter contract? So think about all of those things in the previous slide and start to identify some of those things. You may wanna pause the video at this point. So the third section is about oversight. 
So once you've reviewed the application, approved it, engaged in the contract, and signed it within the parties, then the school moves forward to developing the school and then operating the school. And so effective authorizers have regular scheduled analysis of the performance against those expectations. And so those happen on and off site. So like we said, ineffective authorizers micromanage things. And so it is not, and it should not be your expectation that you should be in the school all the time. In fact, you want to minimize the amount of time that you are in the school as much as possible. So identifying what are the deliverables, academic, financial, operational, that you can collect via regular reports, and those oftentimes are board meeting minutes, financial docu documents that are on a monthly basis or an annual uh, financial audit. Additionally, academic data. So what academic data do you need in order to measure and determine the outcomes of your contract. Finally, um, what, are, what are the mission pieces that you, you can observe uh, or that you can hear back from the school uh, that will help you determine whether or not the mission is being fulfilled. Now there is value in going on site and visiting the school because you really want to see and validate the data that you're receiving on a regular basis. That often happens with school reviews and school visits. Now school reviews and school visits shouldn't just be showing up, kicking back and kind of seeing how things are going. We believe that good on-site reviews and visits are predefined and are guided by clear protocols for those processes. And all of it is only collecting evidence that you will use as part of your oversight and ultimately your renewal determination. So take a moment to go back to the worksheet and consider what are ways in which you can effectively fulfill your oversight in order to preserve school autonomy. Because it's easy to overstep and not uh, allow the school to do those things because you want to provide good oversight. But one of the essential principles of authorizing is preserving the school's autonomy. So how can you provide your oversight effectively with still preserving the school autonomy? Take a second, pause the video, and come back to it once you've written that down. Corrective action and intervention, the fourth of the five, piece, five pieces of the pie. So you can see in the red text that this is only as needed. So don't, don't misinterpret that this is a required component and you should have corrective action as part of everything that you do. You need to be able to be prepared uh, to execute on corrective action and interventions when needed and when merited. So if a school's performance falls below those expectations that are in the contract, effective authorizers communicate those concerns and then with those communications, they identify the consequences. So interventions should rely on conditions that trigger, trigger the intervention. So let's say you're in a five-year contract term and after the second year of operation, the academics are significantly lower than what you anticipated at the end of the second year. And you know that since they're lower, the school has a difficult, will have a difficult time achieving the academic outcomes that are identified for the fifth year of operation. Now, some intervention protocols identify what to do. And so, an effective authorizer would intervene with some type of notice to the school to say, you're falling, you've clearly fallen behind, here are the ways, here's the data that point that out. We need to know how you're going to resolve this and uh, we need concrete information about it. So identifying what your expectations are and how the school ought to communicate and what it is that you need in return to know is important. So um, it needs an expected outcome that's requ required for the resolution, a deadline for the submission, and potential consequences if the inter intervention is not met. So you don't have to threaten revocation, and in fact, you shouldn't threaten revocation with an intervention. 
if something escalates, so if that poor performance persists over time, despite previous interventions, that could lead to uh, revocation. The other side of it is if there are egregious acts that um, merit immediate action, so something that is uh, going on child endangerment or um, threatening the, the health and safety of students, and it is disregarded by the school, you might actually um, think about revocation. But all of this ought to be defined in clear protocols that define your process that you've agreed to with your school as an authorizer for how you would enter into corrective action or intervention. So take a moment to go back to that worksheet and think about how can we intervene to help schools without compromising their autonomy. Again, clear expectations, you're following the procedure. How can you do that more effectively with the schools you authorize? Pause this for a second. Finally, with the cycle of effective authorizing, we say that everything leads to renewal. An effective authorizer bases decisions solely on the evaluation of performance against those expectations. So if you've engaged in the cycle and everything that precedes it, you will have accumulated the evidence that you need in order to make effective, well-defined, clearly articulated renewal determinations. So those decisions need to rely on clear conditions within the contract and we don't want any ambiguity. So renewal should not come as a surprise. A school uh, should, so long as they are operating effectively and they're receiving regular information and communicating back and forth, should know whether or not they qualify or should qualify for renewal going into that final year of the contract. It's all based on standardized annual data, transparent, no surprises, and engages in the evidence that you've accumulated. So again, think about this. Do your authorizing practices reinforce your renewal processes? To pause this and take a moment to reflect on whether or not this is the case. So coming back to the entire cycle of effective authorizing, we do say that renewal starts with authorization. So thinking that you're ultimately going to make, be making determinations in your contract during renewal time, we folk, you should align what it is you look for in your new school application process and think about how that will lead to the most effective schools that will earn renewal. And you want to make sure that you're aligning all of those expectations essentially backward through each of the pieces of the pie so that there are no, no uh, surprises as you go through things. So as a final reflection, you'll have an opportunity to post uh, either both or one of these reflections in the buzz area of the course. So really think about which areas of the cycle of effective authorizing do we need to address? All, one, two, what are the areas that you need to focus on and explain? Why is it and what is it that you need in order to uh, improve there? Finally, who do you need to involve to support your office's improvements? So you might need a financial expert, uh, somebody that you can turn to. You might need somebody to help you out with one of your additional pieces of, of compliance. You might need a new data specialist or just access to somebody who can help you crunch numbers and understand a certain assessment that you want to run into your contract. So take some time to really think about each of these aspects and post them to the buzz section of the course. I really appreciate that you took the time to walk through this. Uh, we have additional buzz coursework that gets in more detail in all of these aspects of the cycle of effective authorizing. And we have additional programming that we're doing with works. So feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I'm available at the uh, email address there. And I appreciate the fact that you took the time to engage with me.